distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, members of the UWI community, good afternoon to you all. Um, I think everybody knows me pretty well, but just for the record, my name is Jessica Byron. I'm the director of the Institute. And I'd like to welcome you to this forum on climate change, its effects on islands, and what we can do in response to the existential changes that we are now living through in the Caribbean and elsewhere. Now the forum is part of a two-day interdisciplinary comparative workshop that concluded earlier today. Um, I'll leave my colleague, Professor Rob Albro, to tell you a little bit more about that. Um, but I just want to say that the Institute of International Relations is extremely pleased to have partnered with our colleagues from the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington and the American University and to have welcomed a number of outstanding scholars, both from abroad and from right here at UWI. Uh, there has been tremendous mutual learning in the exchanges of the past two days. Unfortunately, the forum is especially timely and resonates even more than it would otherwise have done because of the devastating impact of two Category 5, Category 4 hurricanes, Irma and Maria, in several Caribbean neighboring territories and the US mainland uh, over the past three weeks. We and the rest of UWA stand and act in solidarity with our brothers and sisters as they try to deal with their losses and to rebuild their lives in the aftermath of these hurricanes. Now these events horrify and depress us and they remind us yet again of Orlando Patterson's Children of Sisyphus analogy <clears throat> that our small island territories struggle for development is like Sisyphus rolling the boulder up the hill only to have it roll right back down. They raise so many questions for the Caribbean about the social, economic, and environmental viability of our territories, but also about our potential to be agents in shaping our resilience and our adaptation strategies and not succumb to victimhood, about how to deepen regional solidarity, about the role of the state and about local community and individual responsibilities. Now these are just some of the issues that we hope to hear more about during the forum. I welcome and thank our, our panelists and I wish for us all a very fruitful and very stimulating afternoon's discussion. Thank you all very much. Good afternoon. Uh, it's so nice to see you all here. I know you have busy lives as students or faculty, so we appreciate uh, that you've made the time to join us in this conversation and dialogue. Uh, my name is Rob Alvaro. I'm an uh, associate research professor in the Center for Latin American and Latino Studies at American University in uh, Washington, D.C. And I just wanted to start out by uh, saying how grateful we are to the Institute of International Relations for so ably hosting us over the past two days. It's been a wonderful collaboration working with uh, Jessica and her team um, in uh, the workshop that we've just concluded and in the public forum that we're now um, undertaking. Um, these are the kinds of partnerships that can be very constructive and, and mutually illuminating and we've already learned and so we're very thankful. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, this uh, public forum comes out of uh, a two-year initiative, uh, a funded project in our center, uh, in the uh, Center for Latin American Studies, focused on the intersections uh, broadly of religion with uh, climate change, uh, funded by um, an initiative on religion and global affairs 
our international affairs um, at the Henry Luce Foundation. And part of the inspiration for this project is a felt sense among us as uh, researchers uh, in the center that uh, the uh, variable of religion, uh, broadly conceived, has not as of yet been uh, fully taken account of when we think of the uh, community responses to climate change or in the mode of adaptation or resilience or na oh, pardon me, national, uh, are we good? Okay, he says wait. I'm just gonna keep talking. Uh, national level uh, policy responses to uh, climate change as we frame those uh, those uh, policy discourses and practices. So we've had a series of uh, international meetings of which this is the third and final. And just briefly to give you a sense of kind of how we've done this, um, our first meeting was in Delhi, India, and we were bringing together uh, researchers, practitioners, and policymakers who think about uh, questions of water scarcity in the context of uh, global megacities of the South. And so the idea was to identify a critical feature of the effect of climate change, the exacerbation of water scarcity, fresh water availability in large cities, and to do that in a comparative way, um, a sort of north-south, in this case south-south, uh, think you know Mumbai, India, you know Rio, uh, Brazil. Um, we had a second similar meeting in Lima this past May, uh, which brought together researchers who focus on mountains and glacial melt, and there we were trying to catalyze a conversation between. Uh, people who work primarily or focus primarily on the Himalaya and people who focus on the Andes. Uh, and these past two days, what we've wanted to do is to bring together people who work in and around questions relating to climate change in the Pacific with uh, people doing similar things in the Caribbean context, uh, focusing on the particular uh, challenges faced by small island developing states um, in the context of climate change. And we actually had an abs absolutely outstanding workshop conversation, which we're gonna continue here uh, in a moment. So that briefly is the context. And I think specifically what we hope to do with this conversation is to focus on a particular part of that bigger picture and think constructively about what role um, civil society actors have to play in uh, the set of relationships uh, that pertain in thinking about and in uh, the practice of the response to climate change. So civil society actors as agents in a variety of ways of the movement of knowledge uh, in the collaboration with counterparts and in articulating uh, responses to climate change, often working with communities uh, when they do that but also sort of taking a critical approach to that. How has this been effective? What are the challenges around this consideration that remain? And how might we think about this in the best possible way going forward, given what we know? Uh, and uh, part of that involves uh, faith-based organizations as one important category of civil society actor. So with that brief overview, um, I think I'm going to turn it over to the moderator for the forum. And so I want to introduce Roger Mark D'Souza. He is the director of the Program on Population, and Environmental Security, and Resilience at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, uh, which is part of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. And we've been working with Roger Mark in various ways um, in addition to their program co-sponsoring the workshop that we've just concluded along with ourselves and with the IIR, uh, we had a very successful climate diplomacy uh, symposium this past summer in Washington at the Wilson Center, which was focused on um, the specific concerns around climate change in small island developing states. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Roger Mark. Thank you very much. 
much, Rob, and, and welcome. We're so pleased to have a full room uh, for this afternoon's discussion. And I, I know when folks ask me, uh, what are you here to do? And we say we're here to talk about uh, climate change and religion. The first reaction is, huh? How are those things connected? How do you deconstruct uh, what it means to understand the impacts of climate change on religious practice, on religious organization? And what are the connections? What are sort of the practical ways that we begin to look at these issues? So I hope uh, coming out of this afternoon's discussion, and we're looking for you to participate actively, we hope you'll have a greater understanding of the impact of, of climate change on small island developing states, um, in particular looking at the Caribbean basin but also the, the South Pacific, and, and have a sense of what are some of the ways that we as islanders are reacting. And we hope that as you hear some of the stories, not just of how we're dealing with climate change impacts, but how we are looking at engaging the um, religious um, components, the religious community, religious organizations, that you are inspired you're inspired um, and, and find very practical ways to think about what you could be looking at in your studies, in your activism, and in your conversations that you would have at home or in your places of worship and your neighborhood and, and with your friends. So we're looking to um, have you come away with a little bit more information, some inspiration, and a, a call to action. And I think this is very important for us to have this, this kind of conversation. I'm really pleased to have four colleagues with me here on the panel this afternoon because I think we will be complementing each other, other quite well. But before I hand you over to Professor John Agard, I wanted to um, go back to some of the words that we have coming out from the region prior to the Paris Climate Agreement when there was a movement around focusing on the goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius as the target that we should be looking at in the Paris Agreement. So as my colleague will be talking about in a little bit, um, there was a very strong movement from the Pacific, and of course the Caribbean region was very much involved. And part of that was thinking about how folks in the Caribbean would talk about these connections. So um, our St. Lucian brother and poet, Stephen Dantes, had, had been writing a little bit about this, and I, I hope some of you are familiar with his work, but he talks about 1.5 reasons to keep this earth breathing. And he talks about SIDS, small island developing states. And he writes that SIDS catch the cold when the world does the sneezing. Goodbye sandy beaches, goodbye fish stalks, goodbye tropical fruit and seeds. Life now in SIDS is measured in degrees Celsius instead of academic degrees. Lives in this countries have long reached their breaking point. But at the rate that we are going, Castries, Bridgetown, Kingston, Georgetown will be underwater and cut off with no airports and no harbor. Marshall Islanders will be fighting like martial artists who are remembered as once existed and tradition will be lost in the melting caps of the Arctic and the Antarctic and rising sea levels of the Atlantic and the Pacific. Lives that once thrived and cultures that drowned with global warming, economies that could no longer survive. Like Antigua, Bahamas, Fiji, Jamaica, Haiti, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Tonga, Trinidad and Tobago, Tuvalu, Vanuatu, and many other islands, begging, pleading, bleeding, crying. So there's a certain image of vulnerability and fragility that's presented of islanders and climate change impacts. I think part of what we have been discussing in the past day and a half is that we are much more than this image. We are vulnerable um, and we have to pay close attention to the impacts on us. We recognize that as we discuss among the Pacific and the Caribbean that we are not all the same. 
Some of us have different topographies, different uh, small scattered ecosystems. Our people, yes, are all uh, concentrated in small areas. We have a high frequency and variety of natural disasters, and there's a close coupling of terrestrial, coastal, and marine systems that results in a fast spreading impact across the systems. But there's a lot that is happening on the ground. So we're going to kick off our discussion um, this afternoon. I'm going to hand it over to Professor John A. God, who is going to show us more of the science and the statistics around the impact that we heard from our St. Lucian brother. Many of you know Professor A. God well. He's currently the Director of Research, Development, and Knowledge Transfer here at the University of the West Indies in St. Augustine. He's a professor of tropical island ecology, and his research interest is in the field of sustainability science, looking at mainstreaming environmental considerations such as biodiversity conservation and climate change impacts and adaptation into the core of policy and national decision making. He's been very active on the international scene. He's a lead author of the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Fourth and Fifth Assessment Reports. And those of us who work on climate change you know this is our Bible and then we refer to all the time. So, Professor Agard, um, it's a pleasure to have you here, and I hand it over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I wanted to show in the uh, few minutes that I have uh, just a few slides so we need to get the projector on. Um, now, um, while why we while we waiting to uh, get in the The, 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 the topic of the, the, the conference was related to uh, climate change and religion, two things that for many people seem to be in opposition. Um, but I would like to tell you that perhaps for some people, uh, climate change from the scientific point of view is a religion of its own. And uh, you know, uh, both communities influence each other. So what I wanted to do was to try and see if I could show you where I think the discussion um, with the religious community fits in. I'm going to stick to the hard science. So the topic, how is climate change affecting islands and what could we do about it? Um, mention was made, don't get scared about the, the science. Um, I just wanted to set the, frame, set the framework so that we get the science out of the way, because the science is the easy part. This is the least interesting part, in fact. It is, it's all about people and communicating with people. And the truth of the matter is that the way that scientists write um, it doesn't communicate with very many people. Their language is terse and buttressed and you know, very, very difficult. So I just wanted to set the scene, because um, there's some confusion about what is going on. First, let me tell you that um, climate change is a natural process, okay? Um, the climate has changed before, you know, humans did anything before. And I, 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 I put up a little diagram there to try and explain to, to you what is happening, which is that the Earth rotates around the sun in an orbit, but the orbit is elliptical. It's not circular. And that part of that orbit decays. So over a period of 100,000 years, the orbit is closer to the Earth, and the orbit goes out over that 100,000 years. When you're in the inner orbit, the Earth heats up on its own. When you're in the outer orbit, the Earth cools down, and you go into an ice age. So there's a natural process. And you'll see a graph below with red and blue. The, the, the blue is the carbon dioxide concentration, and the red is the temperature going over the last 300,000 years. You'll see 
you see it peaks, and then you'll see the graph going down. There's an ice age. Now, if we warmed up the Earth during the time when we were in an ice age, it would have been great. The Earth would have been much warmer, nicer. But we happen, human beings happen to have added something to our process in which we were at the peak of the warming, naturally. So you see the cycle over the last 300,000 years going up and down, up and down, and it'll probably remain um, you know, warm for you know, 20,000 years or something like that before maybe we will start to get cooler again. But during that period where we reached to the peak of a new cycle, human beings did something and added on a part. So you'll see uh, where the, the blue is going up, uh, I don't know if you, right, you can see right here, I checked what the carbon dioxide concentration was, it's now 405 parts per billion, okay? It's gone up from about 280 parts per million um, since we started to talk about this. Now, you'll see that the blue line is much higher than the peaks that have occurred before. So human beings have added something onto the natural process, okay? You've heard in this conference, people have referred to the Anthropocene and, and all of the, you know, the human added part, but there is a natural cycle. Um, so what happens in the future, we don't know. Um, scientists do modeling, uh, we've done modeling. We have a big high performance computer in the building next to us, 128 core server, and we model going to the year 2100. Um, it's just physics, okay? It's very boring. And I just want to show you, if we go from the current 405 parts per million to 13,000, 1,350 parts per million of carbon dioxide, it will warm about four degrees centigrade, okay? That's referred to as, and the warming is 8.5 watts per meter squared. If we go to 850 parts per million, it will be about three degrees centigrade higher by the year 2100. If we go to um, perhaps 650 parts per million, it will warm by about two degrees centigrade. And that is what the Paris Agreement is aiming at. No more than two degrees centigrade. You'll see it levels off a little bit. If we enforce the Paris Agreement, everybody does what they're supposed to do. People say, not likely. Um, and if, if we went for the ambition level, the 1.5 degrees centigrade that was sparked off in the Caribbean, in CARICOM, 10 years ago, 1.5 to stay alive, and which there was advocacy in Paris, and that remarkably, I didn't think it was going to happen, ended up in the Paris Agreement as an ambition level, okay? Good advocacy. That will indicate to you the importance of communication and advocacy. It would not have happened, and it started right here in the Caribbean. The whole world is going to say, 1.5, to stay alive, we need to do better than the two degrees centigrade that the developed countries have decided for the rest of us. Do the best you can, they told us, in the small islands. And we said, not good enough. So, so that was some feed up from the Caribbean, joined by partners in the Pacific, uh, and, and in AOSIS and other islands and so forth. We ran some modeling for, for Trinidad and Tobago, since we're in Trinidad and Tobago. This is the same set of 42 global models. I just want to look at the averages at the end. And this is the increase in temperature to the year 2100. And if you look at the, I think that probably the line we are heading on is what we call RCP um, 6.2, which is the second to last one, the orange one, which will mean if we don't do anything, we'll end up about two degrees centigrade warmer in Trinidad and Tobago by the year 2100. We've done We've done studies like this for every island in the Caribbean, all the way down to Jamaica, okay? Um, you know, my colleagues in the Mona campus and in the Cave Hill campus and colleagues in other islands and stuff, we run all the models. So we know if we don't do anything, we know what is likely to happen. We're not predicting the future, okay? Rainfall, precipitation. If you look at the averages of the models on the side, you'll see, and this is a percent change. So the black part, is the historical rainfall. And I want you also to look at, so you'll see there's a, possibly a slight decrease in rainfall, maybe 15% going forward, okay, from the averages at the side. But I want you to look at the peaks. You see historically in Trinidad and Tobago, there have been bigger peaks. And these are a bit lower. Because I want to compare that with, if you look at, say, Barbados, you'll see the peaks going forward are higher, more extreme events. 
Okay? Here is St. Lucia. You see, more extreme events. All right? I'm claiming proof of concept. It's happening now. Okay? I was set straight. I was in a meeting with CARICOM ministers, 15 ministers um, in, in Miami. Uh, it was organized by the Global Water Partnership. And I was saying, you know, climate change is not any particular incident. It's a long-term trend. Year 2050, 2100. And the minister from Jamaica um, set me straight. He said, I am facing people now who are suffering from the consequences of this. Give us ideas about what to do. Nobody's interested in the science. Okay? It's, it's unfolding right now. So I've taken that on board. I think he's correct. Um, I just mentioned before we get off the science, the, the sea level rise as well. This is from the satellites, Topex, Jason 1, Jason 2, which have a radar that reflects off the sea and you can get. So we know the trend is the sea level rising, is, is rising in the Caribbean. Um, there are sea level monitors in each island, but here's the Caribbean sea, 2.7 millimeters per year. Okay? It's, so I'm taking that as given. This is just science. Not my opinion. This is, this is a fax, okay? The sea level is rising. It's pointless to argue about as to what the cause is, okay? The temperature is rising everywhere. It's pointless to argue as to what the cause is. How it affects people and what to do is really what we want, need to talk about, the adaptation part, okay? Now, Trinidad and Tobago, like every country that has signed on to the Paris Agreement, submitted a nationally determined contribution. So I'm just going to use this as an example. You could go online and you'll see for each country, um, uh, 196 countries, you will see what they have committed to mitigate this, okay? Um, Trinidad and Tobago says, unconditionally, 30% reduction in, in greenhouse gas emissions by December 31st, 2030, in the public transportation sector compared to business as usual scenario. Conditional, additional reduction achievable under certain conditions, which would bring the total greenhouse gas reduction 15% below business as usual by December 31st, 2030. So every country has made a commitment like this to the mitigation part, okay? Now you say in the Caribbean, like in the Pacific, um, our contribution to greenhouse gas emissions is really small. Uh, you know, in the Caribbean, probably about 0.3%. In the Pacific, even less. But Trinidad and Tobago is disproportionate. Trinidad and Tobago is about close to 1% of the global total of emissions. Disproportionate for our small islands because we have major world-scale industry. So Trinidad and Tobago has a special moral responsibility <laughs> to join with the rest of the global community. They can't say, well, you know, it's one, only 1%. One you know, it won't change anything. That we, we, we don't have to do anything. That's, that's entirely wrong. So I want to open up the argument about responsibility and morality and values. Okay? It's not just about the science. So here's how, just to take the Trinidad and Tobago example, how it breaks down. You'll see the blue line at the top, the total, most of it, the red line below, is coming from the gas-based industry. Okay? Let me just show you that. So it's mainly from the industrial sector. And uh, we did a study with IDB sponsored to break down transport industry and the electric generation sector. You'll see that most of the emissions, this is the actual reconstruction of emissions from Trinidad and Tobago, comes from the industrial sector. So we need to take action on the mitigation part. And studies have been done. This one, the government of Trinidad and Tobago 2014. Elaboration of a strategy for reduction of carbon emissions in Trinidad and Tobago. And all the analyses have been done. Cost benefit analysis, cost efficiency analysis. It's not that we don't know what to do, you know. It's the action part. It's lovely to have studies, okay? It's lovely, okay? All the calculations done. Top experts. And you'll see cost efficiency, the ones that are negative cost efficiency, means that you'll make money from doing these things. Promotion of vehicle energy efficiency and fuel switching, on the way. Promotion of vehicle energy efficiency and fuel switching in, bu sorry, in buses. We have buses running off of CNG, trainers importing hybrid vehicles, no tax on them. Uh, reduction in phase withdrawal of fuel, fossil fuel subsidy, well done yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> But you see, Mr. Imbert has more money in his hands, okay? It's negative cost efficiency. We do CO2 emissions, but end up with more money to use for other things, okay? Operational changes. So you'll see, a lot of this makes good sense from an economic point of view, nothing to do with climate change, you know. All of these measures, you end up with more money in your hands that you could use for other purposes, okay? All right? So 
um, this, there is alignment with science and good sense and the discussion that is taking place, I'm going to tell you, in the religious community. So let me just go to the adaptation part. I'm going to set up my colleague who's going to follow to talk about adaptation. So we know the temperature is increasing, it's a fact. Um, more intense precipitation, proof of concept, happened in the last few, three weeks, okay? Um, tropical storms, here we go. Um, sea level rise, okay, no contest, okay? How does this affect people? It affects their health, for one thing. Rise in infectious diseases, mosquitoes are in their heaven. My colleague who died last year, Professor Dave Chady, discovered that mosquitoes are now breeding underground in septic tanks. This is new. I see the US Center for Disease Control has issued uh, a bulletin about you know, sealing off septic tanks and the pipes and so on, because the mosquitoes are now flying through the pipes to get into there underground, and so they could survive the dry seasons, and they are spreading into places that were too cold for them to breed, because it's warmer underground in the septic tanks. They're breeding, it's dark, there's water, there's organic matter coming in, we are mosquitoes, it's dark, so what? It's great, okay? So this is new, mosquitoes are evolving. And now, besides dengue, and chicken, gunia, and on and on it goes, mosquitoes seem to be have adapted to climate change and are spreading disease. Um, water availability, well, one of, the, one of the trends, besides the more intense you know, precipitation, which provides flooding, during the dry season, the, the general trend was reduction in the amount of uh, rainfall as well. So that has an effect on availability of water for people, but also on agriculture. You will need more drought-resistant crops. Um, agriculture, if you have enough water, you know, CO2 going into the atmosphere, plants use food, CO2 for photosynthesis, so CO2 is a stimulant for plant growth. So if you choose what we refer to in science as C4 crops, ones that benefit with CO2 as a stimulant, you could actually get greater um, crop growth if, if you have enough water, if you have enough water. Um, coastal areas where the sea level rise and accelerate erosion and so forth. So those are some of the things that affect people. Again, I'll take the example of Trinidad and Tobago, like many small islands, because donors have provided money. This one is IDB 2014, cost-benefit analysis of climate change adaptation options to Trinidad and Tobago. I've just taken one page out of it. All the work is done. Um, you know, cost-benefit analysis, payback time in years, ben benefit to cost ratio and stuff like that to choose climate change adaptation options. The ones that have, have the highest benefit to cost ratio, I have a few chosen out in black, like National Building Code. I was surprised, Trent Tobago doesn't have a National Building Code, you know, okay? All right, they say they use, depending on who's building, a British code or a US East Coast code or whatever it is. Boy, are we stupid. Um, you know, we think that maybe Trinidad and Tobago is outside the hurricane belt, so maybe we don't need to strap down the roofs and all of these things. This is insane. It is absolutely insane. This is was news to me. So some of the things you need to do are not very expensive and they're not new. We've been saying this for decades. Decades. It's good sense. Absolute good sense. So you know, if I harvest a few things for adaptation options, because there's a long list, you know, things that seem obvious, National Building Code, mangrove planting, where we're cutting down all the mangroves and we are exacerbating problems in the coastal zone, meteorological alert system, where we're depending on the hurricane center in Miami. You're not hearing anything from here, okay? Uh, all the emergency protocols, the training and so forth. Beach nourishment, agriculture insurance program. But you know, none of this is a surprise. All of this is common sense that we've been saying year after year after year. It's just talking and action, a uh, little diversion. So I want to see if I could wind up by talking about now. You know, here is my framework. Um, you know, we have the climate signal on the y-axis, but the climate signal, which I have, you know, I, I, I have put in 2.6, 4.5, 6.0, no. that could be the, the climate um, scenarios or temperature or, or sea level rise. The climate signal is easy or hurricane intensity, okay? 
We could have put hurricane intensity one, two, three, four, five. But that's the easy part. There's another part, a category five hurricane hitting, I think it is consistent with socioeconomic development, a place that has low sec socioeconomic development like Haiti. The consequences of a category five hurricane where there are millions of people living under tents and with loose sheets of galvanized on them will be quite different from a category five hitting Barbados or Puerto Rico where they have building codes that are enforced, okay? So it's not the magnitude of the climate signal. There's another axis associated with people and their adaptive capacity, okay? That is what has greater effect, okay? If you build all your buildings with a concrete roof and to the proper standards and so forth, you'll get through these intense storms. The engineers and the architects now have to design for uh, you know, um, category f five hurricanes. Maybe they didn't expect winds of 160 to 200 miles an hour. Now that they see that that's happening, the, the one in 100 or one in 150 year event is occurring shorter periods of time. They'll have to design for that. So it's not that we can't design for what is unfolding, okay? Uh, that's quite, quite, quite possible. But you have to have resources. And the socioeconomic development, I'm thinking, might be associated, you know, mitigation capacity, adaptation capacity as well. So what we should be concentrating on is those axes, less on the climate signal. It's all about adaptation and less about mitigation, okay? All right, so my context, you know, I have to speak to governments and decision makers. I'm on the scientific advisory panel to the UN and I've learned to talk their language. So they don't want to hear about science. They've tell me stop. And I know all of that, okay? Talk about people. So all the governments have agreed to 17 sustainable development goals. This is the world that they want, okay? All of these things simultaneously attained, not devise, divided, okay? Um, so that's a source of a good conversation because you'll see climate action as number 13, life below water, life on land, which are environmental, but the rest of the things to be simultaneously attained in order to make that happen involve no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, you know, water and sanitation, affordable clean energy, so renewable energy, energy efficiency and so forth, decent work and economic growth, the, the infrastructure, reduce inequalities, sustainable cities, and so on. All down to, no one has noticed the last two, okay? Peace, justice, and strong institutions, okay? Um, and partnerships for the goals. Because that is the framework in which the discussion here has taken place about religion. The organizations and the frameworks within which people operate, climate change is just another factor to take into consideration. It doesn't replace everything else. And in order to make progress, we need partnerships, okay? And we need to communicate with people in their own language, within their own framework. Otherwise, all of this is a waste of time, okay? Um, my showing you graphs and models and stuff, no one is interested. I'm only doing that because we happen to be in a university. So <laughs> we have the Paris Agreement, two degrees centigrade target, the 1.5 degrees Celsius ambition level, which the Caribbean contributed to feeding up, okay? Our framework in which we're doing work is global, regional. We have scenarios developed at different levels down to the Caribbean as well. And there's a discussion between these two levels. It's not all feed down that we are too small to influence things globally. I think the fact that the Caribbean has influenced the Paris Agreement is a feed up that if we organize ourselves and we act together, okay, we can influence the global climate. We have with the Paris Agreement, okay? So, so it's not a one way arrow from the global down to the various scenarios. There's also a feed up as well. So I want to end up by trying to show you that God is not a trini because I keep hearing that all the time. <laughs> we outside the hurricane belt. Well, there have been three hurricanes and they were hurricane category when they hit Trinidad and Tobago. One, the red line below is the 1933 unnamed hurricane. It's unnamed, okay? You see it came from off the East Coast, right? Then there was Ivan and then there was Florida that passed through Tobago, okay? Now, 
I don't want to scare anybody, but I'll just tell you the truth. We had another study done, sponsored by IDB. And one of the things we discovered is that over the last 15 years, um, a number of tropical storms that develop into hurricanes started to develop past the latitude to the end of Trinidad, okay? Hurricanes normally form in West Africa, come across the Atlantic, they come towards Trinidad and Tobago and they swerve. Because we know God is a Trinity, it won't hit us, we throw a party, okay? Um, now they're forming, uh, for the last few years, a number have been forming closer to the equator. And what is happening is instead of doing like this and missing us, we're getting into the curve, okay? Why is it coming, starting more this way? We're getting into the curve, okay? So God is not a trainee, okay? We need to enforce the building codes and we need to get our act together because Trinidad has world-scale industrial facilities. This is the world's six largest ammonia plants, for example. Atlantic LNG is the, is the second largest uh, you know, facility of that kind in the world now. Okay? Um, we could lose, in a matter of hours, an extraordinary amount of GDP. That is, orders of magnitude beyond what any other small island has lost. Okay? In hours. Efforts of lifetimes. Besides people's houses, the industrial base could be gone in an hour. And we have lots of rigs offshore and incredible infrastructure that could be lost uh, in hours. Um, so climate change, here was a map generated about storm surge. I want to point you to Maracas Beach, where most vulnerable to storm surge. You'll see the color coding, that's the most vulnerable place. Then in the Gulf of Paria and so forth. It's happened already, you know. Anybody remembers this? Our waves are coming, waves are coming, and then one wave came and it just went up the beach and people were driving on the road and they found themselves in seawater. But what, what was going on? Never happened before. People were driving on the road behind Maracas Bay and ended up with seawater. Okay? It's called storm surge. Okay? Right? And happened in the most vulnerable place. Um, extreme events. This is the East Coast. You remember this? Okay, the road exploded and was cut off. So I'm just saying, in um, case you haven't been paying attention, that was supposed to be a one in a hundred year event. Okay? Um, and that is really what is happening now. One in a hundred, one in 50, one in 25, one in 15, one in 10. We need to get our act together. It's unfolding as we speak. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Egard. Never a doubt. Presentation. Um, so thank you so much. I think you've raised a number of important questions for us. And I just want to also acknowledge that um, the event is being uh, live streamed. So we, I know we have a number of people who are joining us online. So wel welcome to, to the discussion. I'd like to pass it on to our next colleague now, Dr. Lisbon McLeod. And, and Lizzie, uh, you know, I'm going to ask you to tell us whether God is not a Pacific Islander. So uh -oh. <laughs> think a little bit about that. But Lizzie directs the Nature Center's climate um, adaptation work for the Asia Pacific region. She's an adaptation scientist and she does a lot of work around reef resilience. She was quite instrumental in developing the Nature Conservancy's Reef Resilience Toolkit, which has been used in more than 75 countries. Most recently, uh, she's been linking her work on climate resilience um, and engaging faith groups to build evidence base that protecting and restoring land and water globally enriches human lives and protects the diversity of life on, on Earth. So I know Professor Agard has teed this up quite well for you, so we're looking forward to hear your perspective um, from the Pacific. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much to uh, the Institute for International Relations, American University, and the Wilson Center for hosting this event. It's my honor to be here and share with you my experiences as a climate scientist working in the Pacific. I hope that I'm able to amplify and share the voices of my Pacific friends, colleagues, and leaders who have so powerfully fought to bring climate change to the global stage. A common refrain that we hear 
is that the Pacific Islands are on the front lines of climate change. Increasing sea levels, temperatures, leading to food and water shortages, flooding and erosion. But when homes and lands become uninhabitable, they leave behind environmental refugees. The vulnerability of the islands is repeated in scientific policy reports, scientific papers, news articles, but what is underappreciated is the extent to which the islands have taken a global leadership role in climate, shaping climate advocacy, calling for ambitious emission reduction targets and implementing strategies to help communities to better cope with climate change and to be more resilient. The urgency and the immediacy of climate change in the Pacific prompted their leaders to make powerful statements at global events such as the COP in Paris. The Prime Minister of the small island Tuvalu said, just imagine you are in my shoes. I believe that no leader in this room carries such a level of worry and responsibility. No leader can say that the total of his territory, all citizens, will disappear if we allow temperatures to increase one and a half degrees. Selena Leem is an 18-year-old from the island of Majuro in the Marshall Islands. And she spoke at the final plenary in Paris. And she said, this agreement is for those of us whose identity, whose culture, whose ancestors, whose whole being is bound to their land. I have only spoken about myself and my islands, but the same story will play out everywhere in the world. If this is a story about our islands, it is a story for the whole world. Pacific Island and Caribbean Island leaders were instrumental in shaping the Paris Agreement. They were vocal advocates to limit warming to one, one and a half degrees. Collectively, they called for a loss and damages clause to be included that allows islands compensation for the impacts of cyclones and weather-related events. And now in November, for the first time, we have an island nation, Fiji, leading the COP. I believe that there are three things that the world can learn from the Pacific Islands to support a global response to climate change. One, the Pacific is the bellwether for the rest of the world. Two, islands are natural laboratories for developing and testing new ideas for how to respond to climate change. And three, we have a political and moral imperative to support those who's com who contribute the least, yet who bear the brunt of climate change. And this is where faith communities come in. As the bellwether, the Pacific provides a warning of what is to come for the rest of the world if we cannot reduce emissions. They are also leading the call globally for comprehensive and immediate climate responses, challenging us not only to meet our emission targets, but to aim for bolder ones. And they provide a stark reminder of what is at stake. Unlike many coastal communities in the West, Pacific Islanders often cannot just move their homes back from the shoreline. Land is limited in small islands and often is traditionally owned and inherited. So many communities cannot simply move to higher ground. And when entire islands are inundated, people lose their sovereignty. Remember the words of Selena from the Marshalls, our identity, culture, ancestors, whole being is bound to our land. So there are significant social, cultural, and psychological costs associated with climate-related migration. Loss of tradition, loss of language, loss of identity, livelihoods, community cohesion. And there are also economic costs associated with displacement and migration from both countries where those are leaving and those who are receiving climate refugees. And reminding us of these costs, of what is at stake, is a key role of the Pacific Island nations. My second point, islands as learning laboratories. Pacific Islands provide tremendous learning opportunities for testing and refining adaptation options for how to build resilience to climate change. The Pacific
Pacific Islands are home to unique species that are found nowhere else on Earth. They cover 6.7 million square kilometers of ocean. They're incredibly diverse in terms of their ecosystems, geography, and demographics. Communities in the Pacific have lived with environmental impacts for thousands of years, and they've adapted practices to accommodate to periods of drought and heavy rains. And although now the pace of changes they're experiencing is much faster, many communities are revitalizing traditional practices, like using seaweed as compost to make their soils more fertile, using palm fronds to shade plants to reduce the stress from drought, and planting vegetation to reduce the impacts of storms along the coast. And many of these local actions utilize the benefits that nature provides, and many are also being led by women. While such practices help to reduce impacts locally, they must be complemented with support from the global community, including both technical and financial support. The Nature Conservancy, where I work, has been working with communities across the region to test and refine adaptation strategies that build the resilience of both communities and ecosystems to climate change. We're developing innovative climate finance mechanisms such as incorporating nature into insurance risk models, piloting insurance products that incentivize nature-based defenses like coral reefs and mangroves. And we're working with islands to roll out and share successful examples across the region. So now to my third point, the injustice of climate impacts, our political and moral imperative to act. <coughs> the Pacific only produces 0.03% of global emissions, yet they bear the brunt of climate change. Beyond climate advocacy and implementing adaptation options, they are at the mercy of the largest emitters of greenhouse gases to meet global emissions targets. Thus climate change shifts from being a purely environmental issue to a political and moral one. And this is where religious leaders and partnerships with faith organizations and communities are vitally needed. Religious groups have a central role to play in highlighting the importance of addressing climate change, climate justice, and acknowledging the increased burden on the world's most vulnerable. Pope Francis's encyclical equates the protection of nature with the protection of human rights. In addition to the Pope, all major faiths have signed declarations on climate change. In the lead up to the Paris Agreement, 1.8 million people signed faith-based petitions calling for climate action. And religious groups in the Pacific have also been active in addressing climate change. The Pacific Conference of Churches drafted the Otentai Declaration in 2004, and it was the first official statement by Christian churches in the region to alert the world to the urgency of climate change. In 2009, the Pacific Council of Churches drafted the Moana Declaration, discussing the threat of forced relocation and displacement by islanders, highlighting the need to care for and provide land for climate refugees. And in 2016, they established the Toka Toka Declaration, which called on the global community to more effectively engage churches in both climate and disaster response. So in addition to these regional declarations, faith communities in the region have been really active and involved at the local level, such as the negotiation of land rights in the Carteret Islands in Papua New Guinea. Church-run schools have included climate change in the curriculum, and they're leading faith-based environmental projects to help communities to plan for and respond to climate change. But despite the importance of religion in daily life and the large number of, of adherents, interestingly, most climate projects led by Western organizations in the Pacific are secular. A climate researcher who spent several decades working there said, God is often sidelined in the Pacific when addressing climate change issues. And I have seen similar issues with my own experiences working at the Nature Conservancy but I've also seen the power of faith and conservation partnerships, like in the Solomon Islands, where it led to increased engagement of women in environmental decision making. So why is engaging faith groups critical to supporting climate action? Faith communities have been important advocates 
for climate policies that help to ensure that they support the most vulnerable communities. They contribute substantially to development programs. Community water tanks are often located in the church. They're often first responders following disaster. And often they're the center of the community, providing the moral authority, and thus providing an impetus for faith-based action. Partnerships between governments, universities, conservation and development groups, and faith groups can bring together the ecological, social, and ethical concerns of communities to ensure that climate policies and actions are scientifically sound, improve human well-being, and that the benefits are equally distributed and address the needs of all. As governments, development, and conservation organizations work to implement adaptation strategies in the Pacific, it is critical that they engage faith communities to communicate the realities of climate change. To build projects that reinforce the power of women and other marginalized groups. Building on traditional knowledge and highlighting the critical role that healthy ecosystems play in climate mitigation and adaptation. So after 15 years working on the front lines of climate change, I can share personally why faith engagement is so essential to climate diplomacy and action. Not only does it help us to ensure that our efforts are targeted at those who are need it most, but it also reminds us to hold on to hope. For some living on small, low-lying islands in the Pacific, faith and hope are all that they have left. Thank you. to think about ways that we are similar or different from the Pacific. What, one question that I wanted to ask you quickly and to build on some of the comments that we have from Professor Agard. You know, you've both spoken about uh, questions around adaptation mm -hmm. and mitigation, but you use a third bucket that I think is very important for us to have a clear understanding of if we're looking at questions about morality, engagement, action, climate change, and small island developing state SIDS. And it's this, this concept of loss and damage mm -hmm. so tell us what is what is loss and damage because we you know we talk about mitigation reducing co2 emissions adaptation how we're dealing with the negative impacts of climate change what is loss and damage well I will first start by saying I'm not an expert in this space and so I'm probably guessing that John you might have some more to add to this um, my understanding of it is that the idea is that it's not enough to have uh, funding support for climate impacts, um, but we also need to have guaranteed support following weather-related events, um, such as hurricanes. Um, and so that because of the injustice of the way that climate change is playing out with the largest emitters um, essentially causing the problem, that they have a responsibility to pay for um, some of the impacts beyond climate change that would include through hurricanes and storms. But John, feel free to weigh in. I think you, you, you got it right there. Um, you know, if in the insurance industry, um, insurance companies have actuaries. And actuaries, you know, use their statistics. Um, so they can tell what the probability of an event occurring is. Okay? Um, people in the Caribbean... And, I, and the same thing in the Pacific will know that during certain months, you know, insurers won't accept uh, responsibility for things caused by intense storms. For example, if you had a boat and you were within the hurricane belt during certain months, they have many years ago stopped accepting insurance. In the Trinidad and Tobago, since we're in Trinidad and Tobago, on the east coast of Trinidad and Tobago, I think some people here may know that insurers stop insuring houses along a large part of the east coast of Trinidad and Tobago. Okay? Um, that's because it's just a business. They do their calculations. Um, they know what the losses are, what the claims are. And um, then they refuse to accept the risk. So that when something happens, just as what you have described, um, you're left on your own. But then this seems morally <coughs> unfair because you were not the cause of the problem that 
you know, those who are responsible for initiating this in the first place should in fact be responsible for, for the recompense for the damage that occurs, okay? Um, but that's not the case, uh, you know, and that's a big problem, uh, particularly in small island developing states, because a lot of them have no recourse. They have to rely on the goodwill of people for no good reason to come to their aid when they uh, have incredible losses. And we're in a situation like that, I think we'll hear more about that later on, in the Caribbean where whole islands have, within hours, have lost everything. Okay, your house, your life's work, your, 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 you know, where you worked, everything, everything is gone. Um, you know, you cannot get recompense for that in the normal way that you would think of in insurance. It's not going to compensate you for all of that. So there's another aspect of this related to doing what's right, values, morals, responsibility, that those who are the basis of this happening in the first place have another responsibility, and that is where we're in some trouble. Great. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, both John and Lizzie. So, you know, so when we look at climate change, we talk about mitigation, we talk about adaptation, and this third area of loss and damage, if things are damaged like a bridge that can be repaired, there are certain things that will be lost, and once they're lost, they're forever gone. So looking at people's ancestral lands, for example, in the Pacific, if somebody loses his or her ancestral lands through sea level rise, that's gone. So it raises questions of liability, compensation, and morality. So it's a very central to sort of the issues that we look at. So I'm, I'm glad that we also have an opportunity to hear from our next colleague, Brother Harry Prasad Maharaj, who um, looks at these issues and thinks about these issues very much from a justice perspective. He has more than 40 years of extensive and dynamic experiences leading and managing non-governmental organizations and faith-based organizations at a national level. He's worked uh, quite a bit internationally and is also Justice of the Peace for Trinidad and Tobago. So Brother Harry Prasad, welcome. A very pleasant good afternoon. And let me start by saying special thanks to the organizers of this forum for it has been very enriching to me in all of my years I think it's the first time that I'm hearing about the relationship between religion and climate change. Probably because I want to disagree with Dr. Agard that God is still a trini. We noticed in the chart that you show we saw the hurricane that went down below and up to Tobago and further away, but it made sure it kept Trinidad protected. So probably until now I will still have to remain firm and faithful that God is a trini. My dear divine brothers and sisters, um, the question is how climate change is affecting islands and what can we do about it? I, because of the limited time for presentation, I think that each one of us is aware how climate change is affecting the small islands. And of course, we are going to hear a lot more. We have been hearing a lot of what has been happening over the last couple of weeks, and therefore I choose not to deal with that aspect, but instead more on the causes and possible prevention. I am also going to do something which is probably one of the most challenging things for me, and that is to read something that I have written. Because usually I don't do that, I just speak off the cuff. But So please permit me if I make errors in my presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, today we have gathered to share our thoughts on the role of religion in climate change. Please permit me to, show, to share my personal experiences of some of the not so pleasant activities in this small island of Trinidad and Tobago and the role of religion at the time of need, not particularly climate change, but at the time of need. Most of us who are here are Trinidadians, I assume, and so I wish to highlight four things. Firstly, 1990, the attempted coup in our parliament in which lives were lost. A religious personnel was asked to mediate a solution. Two, from December 2nd to February 2nd, 1999 to 2000, 
non-communication between the Prime Minister and President and the calling of a democracy, yours truly intervened and mediated successfully. And three, a citizen in a single hunger protest decided to fast on the streets in front of the Prime Minister's office. And again, you had the privilege of successfully getting him off the streets and later to stop his fasting. And the fourth one, in 2015, particularly the months of June, July, August, again, we are quite familiar, where a particular part of the country, enterprise to be specific, where murder was so high, and once again, yours truly was able to enter that part of the country and lead a peace walk where for three months we recorded zero murder in that area. The intervention and role of religion and religious leaders. And these are just four instances I thought of highlighting as it relates to the value and importance of religion and the religious community. In all of the above examples, it was the collective response of religions from the inter-religious organization for a national cause. More so, the initiative was driven by controlled emotion, and I stress controlled emotions, and a power to bring about positive change. It was the belief that my intentions must be sincere and trusted. This is evident that religion can play a vital role in restoring humanity to a sense of hope and dignity. Two weeks ago, I attended a conference at the Hyatt Regency in Port of Spain. And believe it or not, statistics have shown that only 4% of Trinidad and Tobago citizens trust another person. I don't know how they come up with that data, but only 4% of citizens of Trinidad and Tobago trust one another. As someone who is practicing meditation for just over 40 years and with my affiliation with various religious organizations universally, my religious and spiritual conviction is that the environment is critical to achieving our goal. Therefore, any negative change to the climate, the atmosphere or the environment is of concern and a definite threat. The environment is the first and major contributor to the quality of my thoughts and actions. Adhering sincerely to my core values and religious principles or values is necessary. For without this commitment, I am merely an existence or a mathematical figure. Religion has taught us that there existed a time when there was heaven and earth, and that that heaven became hell by partaking of the forbidden fruit for which we were forewarned. Swami Vivekanand, the brainchild of the Parliament of World Religions, first held in 1883, was once asked a question as to what is the greatest sin of mankind, for which his answer was, anything in excess. The heaven we believe existed and hoping for it to return soon can be measured by three main pointers harmony between man and himself, or peace of mind, man and nature, the relationship between man and nature, that is the absence of natural calamities, and man and man, peace in the world. Today, neither of the three are existent together, and in most instances, not at all. It is therefore incumbent that the so-called keepers of the trust and answers to most solutions for humanity are the religious and spiritual leaders whom we place our confidence as the wise ones and hopefully the ones closest to the creator. Therefore, such persons may have to pay closer attention in being the, therefore, such persons may have to pay closer attention in being the much needed role models to the pointers mentioned above about heaven. In so doing, a lifestyle change will be necessary. Whenever any serious natural calamity occurs, we blame it on God, as it's the act of God. This is not my personal conviction, but rather believe 
that it is nature rebelling or reacting to our misuse or abuse. We can therefore refer to it as the laws of cause and effect. Let me reflect on a, flu on a few of the climatic changes and its relationship with mankind and the changes that are necessary. Global warming. The greatest warming is caused by anger and has to be cooled with peace of mind. Which, what cause, and the example is what cause, what caused what took place in Texas two days ago? with a mass murder that happened just two days ago. Not global warming, but it's the anger in the minds of man. We are familiar with the belief that wars begin in the minds of man. We have gathered here because we want peace in the world. We were not peaceful, and weren't we peaceful and loving beings? Where and how have we lost this most valuable treasure that wealth cannot buy? me. Diseases or multiple diseases. From a stable state of mind, we are now harboring stress and are affected emotionally very painfully. Due to this, this ease of the mind and lack of trust, mainly due to dishonesty and unfaithfulness, especially in relationships, we are suffering with the greatest threat of fear that renders us almost helpless and our lifestyles and the food that we eat our choices who should we blame for such changes ego greed for power land or wealth need to be replaced with humility and contentment the years of hard work was destroyed in minutes of the hurricane and here I'm going to identify what we refer to as the five elements of which even this human body comprises of the five elements. The years of hard work was destroyed in minutes by the hurricane, which is wind. And the same can happen when an earthquake, earth, or flood, water, or cyclone, ether, or lightning, fire occurs. God was never meant to be someone who punishes, but rather the one who come to our aid when called upon. Nature has sent us so many warning signals so often, yet we tend to ignore them and place the blame on God. Let us practice moments of introspection. I am sure that you will find answers yourselves. The burning fire of lust, fueled with drug abuse, has to be replaced with love, care, and respect, so that kidnapping and human trafficking, domestic violence, and abuse of women and children can be stopped. If greed and corruption is not replaced with, com with compassion and contentment, then exploitation, either by individuals, groups, politicians, countries, and even religious groups, will continue to fuel poverty, dependency, and starvation. Small islands like the, Car like the Caribbean can be an easy target, since they are dependent on the larger countries. What are our needs? against our greed. Religious and spiritual leaders, social organizations, NGOs and CBOs, etc., need to play a non-political role in placing pressure on the politicians and those in authority to legislate any possible means of changing the behavior or excesses that is destroying our flora and fauna and consequently all living existences and act more speedily and prioritize the restoration work of the natural night nature and its environment. Climate change must not be viewed as weather patterns only, but must include the quality of our thinking and responses to any activity at any given time and place. Unless we change, unless we can be more responsible for our thoughts and the fruits of our action and consequences, then the devastation will continue beyond human recovery. Let us see and respect all of creation, the beauty and variety, the dignity and speciality in everyone, and especially as a family member, 
a part of our existence and survival, a brother or sister or friend, and rebuild that oneness where we can live without fear. That moment is now before it is too late. I thank you. May peace and love be with one and all. May God bless you. debate about whether God is a trinity or not, so uh, thank you for the comments. I'd like to move on now to our final uh, panelist. Uh, Mr. Ronald Jackson, who is with the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency. He's based in Barbados, and he's been the executive director of SEDMA since 2013. Previously, he served in the capacity of director general of the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management in Jamaica. So, Ron, good to have you with us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And certainly, I want to also express my thanks for being given an opportunity to share some thoughts with you. Uh, mindful of time and also based on the fact that I'm, I'm coming from uh, a front line of, of several responses, I had no time to really prepare, um, let me say, a coherent um, address. So I'm going to share some perspectives and some thoughts with you to enliven the debate. So uh, please bear with me. Um, you would have heard from from John on the, the context regarding climate change and the way it impacts our society from a scientific perspective. And he certainly went into a little bit more around the sort of impact as it relates to, to, to my world, um, which, is, which is disaster risk. And you heard from my colleague um, who operates in the Pacific, which is perhaps one of the, one of the, the most vulnerable parts of the, of the world, the Caribbean being the second most vulnerable. So if we, if we believe that we're the second most vulnerable, then the context for the discussion around climate change really centers on an understanding of the fact that one, we're, we're, we're in an environment where we have changing societal dynamics, um, both in terms of our work life patterns, our lifestyle, our expectations, our demographic changes, our community fragmentation, all increasing the broader community vulnerability. We have increasing urbanization of our societies, which are placing greater burdens on our environmental resources. And of course, the Caribbean, um, one of the most beautiful places on the planet, I'm biased because I live here, um, is certainly filled, that same beauty helps to fuel the inherent vulnerabilities, our small size, our limited resource base, or concentration along our coast or coastline, which is where much of our development exists. In fact, between 60 to 70 percent of our population reside and do business within two miles of our coastline. So that gives a, a sort of context. So what do we see when, when these climate-related events impact um, our, our small space? We see increased infrastructure damage, and I'm painting this picture, even though you may have seen it on television, but for those who live in the land where God is a trini, you may not have really experienced it. Uh, Bajan said God is a trini too, so I'm, I'm wondering <laughs> how, how that shakes out. Huh? Sorry, God is a Bajan, that's correct. God, they said God is a Bajan. <laughs> Both. So increased infrastructure damage, additional emergency preparedness requirements, higher operating expenses. So if you're talking about insurance, backup water supply, power systems, the cost of evacuation, business interruptions. Um, if you're into the business of tourism, you're talking about disincentive for, for travel. Um, you're talking about risk to future economic growth, especially where loss and damage are similar or exceeding your gross domestic product. So it's interesting, I heard the, the, the original comment that SIDS catch a cold um, when the world sneezes. And I asked myself, how do we fortify ourselves against the cold, common cold or the flu? Are we able to prevent it or are we simply coping um, each, each time the, the flu season or the cold season comes around? I think it's something for us to, to contemplate and I think I'm going to get into that a little bit uh, when I talk about how we are dealing with this issue of climate change. So over the last four and a half weeks, you'd have seen, maybe longer than that, if you were looking at the impact of Harvey on the US mainland, and then coming into, into the, the wider Caribbean, 
and I can't help but remember the Prime Minister of Dominica's opening address to the UN where he says he just came from a front, front of a war he did not start. And I had the opportunity to visit that front and many other fronts and it is an ex extremely challenging environment at times dehumanizing um, and you know, you, you know the rest. So we are seeing then the manifestations, not just over this past month, proof, as, as Professor Agard said, we are seeing proof of the concept uh, emerging. But this proof was emerging perhaps uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago. And hence the comment by the, the minister in Jamaica that this is new. We've seen extreme events. In fact, Dominica itself went through a cycle somewhere from 2010 to 2011 where they had extreme rainfall events that caused the breaking of a dam. Then they had the, the Christmas trough in 2013. Um, three countries, but Dominica uh, bore the brunt. Uh, many of the communities impacted now were impacted then. Uh, you had then Erica, Tropical Storm Erica, which um, they still, they've still not recovered from, from Tropical Storm Erica. Much of the bridge infrastructure communities are still in that whole process of recovering. And now you have um, a Category 5 event impacting Dominica. We've seen the images. So are we coping? Are we addressing the issue of climate change? And from a policy perspective, I want to share some, 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 some thoughts with you. I think we've been used to initially addressing the, the existing hazards or the hazards that we are aware of from a historical point of view. You know, we've, we've probably gotten a little bit better. I wouldn't say we're great at it. Um, but we've gotten good at you know, trying to respond to traditional hurricanes and floods. Um, we now have to shift our focus a little bit more to examining what might be a new normal, um, Category 5s. You talked about Trinidad and Tobago, but Category 5 storms occurring before they get to the Windward and Leeward Island um, arc. I've never seen that before. Um, I've never seen a, a hurricane intensify from three to five in less than 12 hours. All right? And people ask the question, when the communication systems disappeared at uh, somewhere between 8 p.m. and 1 a.m. in the morning, was Dominica aware that it was getting a Category 5 hurricane? It's a reasonable question. I mean, they would have lost the ability to see what the Met, the Met services were sharing what the Hurricane Center was sharing. So are we dealing with a new normal and we have to now move beyond the sort of historical references? Not that we don't use it in our analysis, but to wrap our minds around a sort of changing dynamic uh, brought about, about by the increased sea surface temperatures and the intensification of, of tropical cyclones. We, we have to shift our focus now to addressing the issues of underlying causes of vulnerability which also gives us a futuristic perspective. And I think if we put that within the context of sustainable development, where you saw those, was it 17 um, SDG goals, all working in unison to try to address this issue of how we tackle some of these underlying risk drivers. We have to look at shorter return horizons. So you've heard people talk about 100 year events. Um, 100 year events no longer mean they're coming back 100 year apart. They may be 10 and 15, 20 year cycles, maybe five years, um, as you'd have seen um, occurring recently. Uh, a focus on human welfare. All right? The impacts of these events uh, are having tremendous uh, effects on the society, on social infrastructure, uh, on, on, on people, and, and something we need to now begin to look at. And I raise this point because I'm, I'm going to come to it later around the balance between how we're tackling the issue of climate change between mitigation and what, what we now call adaptation. Um, there were disaster risk at one point, and there were good planning practices. I come from an urban and rural planning background. So what should be our focus on it, it, reduction of exposure to risk, reducing vulnerability, we talk about building resilience. What does that really mean? And, and how do we integrate that into our, into our culture and, and, and concepts? Um, I think what we're seeing here is an opportunity for facilitating uh, trans-island opportunities um, for, for things like even evacuation. How do we deal with that across the region? 
<clears throat> so in, in Sedema, one of the things we put forward in 2001, we were on the first organization, the first part of the world that put on, on the, the, the agenda uh, a framework for dealing with risk resilience within the context of sustainable development. And at that time, this was in 2001, before the Yoga Framework of Action came out. It has four pillars. Um, one that looks at institutional strengthening, so normatives, things like the building codes as a priority, financing, preparedness for response. It has knowledge management, which is not only talking about public awareness, but how we're using research and science to inform practice. The third pillar was looking at the, the key sectors of development within the Caribbean context and how we integrate disaster risk reduction considerations within that sector. And the fourth being community resilience building. Um, looking at, at livelihood protection and early warning systems from 2001. And in that context, we saw climate change as a cross-cutting issue. How do we take climate information and integrate that and weave that into the fabric of those, those four pillars? We're in the third iteration of the strategy, 2014 20, to 2024. And it's still uh, the ambition to try and achieve this, this desired end state. So what are we talking about from a disaster and climate resilient region or country. We're talking about having appropriate institutional arrangements in place. We're talking about broad-based awareness of the vulnerability issues and how we treat with them. We're talking about ensuring that we have technical capacities available to deal with the threat or the risk. Um, that there is political will and buying. And interestingly enough, there is tremendous amount of political will for dealing with climate change, but very limited political will on disaster preparedness and disaster prevention um, in the Caribbean. Why is that? Yet every political communique on climate change starts with an acknowledgement that climate change means more intense floods, hurricanes, droughts. But then when we come to looking at how the resourcing and the politics play out, it still is the stepchild of the process. And I think it's something we have to, we have to examine going forward. So within the context of the, of the strategy, we promote uh, a, a partnership. We call it a governance and partnership arrangement with the finance and economic sector, the physical planning and environment sector, the agriculture sector, the education, tourism, health, and the civil society sector. Um, and I think that is part of the confluence between how we look at the, the, the religion and civil society and how it can help to, to drive this agenda for climate resilience or resilience against risk, if you want to put it in that context. And for investment, we're really looking at, you know, really encompassing this dialogue within the broader sustainable development agenda and how it supports that. Stable and transparent and effective governance, which is necessary, harmonizing change and disaster risk. Intersectoral dialogue and coordination of these efforts and looking at the existing practices, tools, and systems, and how research can, can, can help to, to address that. So <clears throat> one of the things I'm, I'm proposing is that you know, we, we have not seen the focus around tackling climate change being grounded in the reality of the challenge for us in the Caribbean. So effects such as those seen um, within the region over the last six weeks, how are we going to use that as an opportunity to recognize that it can't simply be about energy sustainability and, and, um, and renewable, using renewable energy, which is a great opportunity that climate change pre presents. So we've talked about the Pacific and the impact on them and the fact that they have to look at migration and other means of coping. But in the Caribbean, we are taking more of an advantage of the opportunity of climate change, but the impact on us is as we've seen in the last six weeks. So we need, to, we need to create that balance. I'm not saying not take advantage of the opportunity of renewable energy, but how do we get that balance between the investment in strengthening the national and regional humanitarian systems to deal with the challenges we're gonna face in the next 50 years if we, if we are successful with the 1.5 to stay alive. I don't think the climate is gonna heal in 10, 15, 20, 25 to 50 years, I'm asking the scientists. So we're gonna be facing this kind of challenge going forward 
and how do we ensure the, the rights of our citizens to the safety and security um, in those kinds of conditions it is going to require us investing more in the humanitarian architecture within the region and nationally and that's the balance I'm talking about how do we then translate the savings from the energy sustainability energy renewable new renewable energy that we're investing in to now spend in those areas that have been largely marginalized over the many years that's that's a conversation uh, i think we need to we need to we need to engage on so noting the moral and responsibility aspect of it that john spoke about which i fully understand but we need to look at the how we how we put those savings into into the appropriate place so greater investment also. Um, one of the other things I would promote is greater investment into applied research as a means of engaging the practitioners, driving the practice towards where it needs to go. So there are some opportunities in closing. We need to close this artificial separation between climate change and disaster risk reduction and really um, take advantage of the opportunity that the Nexus presents and ensure that the, 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 the limited resources, human and financial, are being more effectively engaged to address the, 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 the issues we're facing. Uh, addressing the imbalance in real resource allocation, uh, looking at the harmonization of policies and financing mechanisms. Opportunities for the religious community, I see them also as a massive convener of citizens' power to effect change. So for example, it always strikes me that when we, when we look at the, the, um, the election period and we're looking at the exit polls, nobody's talking about disaster risk and climate change being important. There's a conversation around crime, security, uh, jobs, um, healthcare, but they're all linked to marginalization of other resources that can be unlocked to provide opportunities there. Um, I see also the religious community as a sponsor of community-based interventions. We talked earlier in the workshop about communities not being victims, but being knowledgeable about how. how. But they lack perhaps some of the sophisticated skill sets that donors ask for to access these resources. How can faith-based organizations also help to, to sort of be a, a facilitator um, in this process? Um, and as a coalition to challenge existing assumptions and actions that present true, that prevent true resilience building. I see the religious community uh, being there. Um, building back better is not just a concept. It was visible in the impact. All the sites I visited in Barbuda, which was almost totally flattened, there were three buildings and one church, a very old church with a tall steeple that was intact. Not one galvanized was missing, not one window blown out. The three houses were more modern, not one galvanized lifted, not one window blown out. What, are, what is the lesson we're learning there? And it's, it wasn't concrete buildings. In Anguilla, they built in concrete. In the BVI, there were houses where the entire roof stayed on, and one government officer said to me, all the houses are brother designed Nothing happened to those houses, including hers. She lost windows, doors, but the roof was on. So there are lessons, and it was evident in every single location we visited. In Dominica, the same thing. So we're talking about building code, but not simply just doing a code. The very important efforts to enforce the building code, not just legislate, enforce. And partnership between government, private sector, including the insurance industry and the engineers are necessary if we're going to ensure that we change this particular culture. So building back is not better is not a concept. It is possible. I've seen it even in the face of Category 5. And I will leave with a quote from Kofi Annan where he said, more effective prevention strategies would save not only tens of billions of dollars, but save tens of thousands of lives. Funds currently spent on intervention and, and relief could be devoted to enhancing equitable and sustainable development instead, which would further reduce the risk for war and disaster. Building a culture of prevention is not, e not easy. While the cost of prevention have to be paid in the present, its benefits lies in the distant future. Moreover, the benefits are not tangible. They are the disasters that did not happen. So this is from Kofi Annan in 1999 and it's still relevant today. So I'll leave with that. Thanks very much for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you.
that that last quotation is is important. Um, do we ever count the disasters that don't happen? Yeah. So let let's open up the the floor. We'd like to hear your thoughts or comments, reactions. Um, if you could raise your hand, and one of my colleagues will come to you uh, with the microphone, and we'd ask you to give your name and your affiliation, and to get quickly to because we, we don't have too much time, but we have a reception afterwards where we could continue our conversation. So uh, if we have a microphone, yes? And are there any other questions? Uh, in front here, please. Yes, to the very front. Messi, hopeful graduate this year. Um, I Oh, I have done a, a study in the postgrad and IR on climate change um, and, and also on public policy within the government. So I understand everything that the presenters said, but um, I'm going quickly into a comment, which I think the, the layman who is affected, he is thinking about survival. And I, I like the last comment that the, our Barbadian presenter gave, in that you have to bring knowledge to the people and use examples of the houses. But not everyone will be able to build back like in Dominica a big house. So the good advice is to start very early before resources are um, given out and we have to be proactive because one little comment is that throughout the generations we have faced finding solution to malaria, typhoid and so we have reached a point now where the climate and survival and sustainability of is, is of critical importance. Great, thank you very much. I think just behind you, you also had your hand up. Alicia Shepard, uh, MSc student. Um, I just have a question in relation to religion and climate change. Um, I'm aware that that's somewhat of a dichotomy because science and religion has always been somewhat at war. Um, how do you presume we bridge that nexus? Because, I mean, some religions teach that what's happening right now is an act of God. So therefore, we will see many more people um, just stay in the background, doing nothing about it. So how, how do we bridge that nexus? Great, thank you. Any more questions? Yes, this gentleman right here, please. Thank you. Yes. Um, very interesting. Uh, uh, just tell us who you are, where you're coming okay. from. Courtney Lindsay, I um, just uh, I was a former student here at um, the institute. I just recently graduated, um, and I am interested in finding out what will be the social fallout um, of all this happening. You know, um, as climate change, as we see changes in the environment um, progress, as you know, what will be the fallout in terms of um, lost opportunities? You know, um, will we have less opportunities for farmers to plant? Will we really see less people going into certain areas such as fishing, such as farming, those areas that will be most affected? Um, by climate change. Will we, uh, in the mitigation efforts, as we try to mitigate and to move from certain areas, what kind of opportunities will be created and what kind of opportunities will be lost by all of this? Um, so will we see increases in crime or will we see a decrease in crime? I mean, how will we as a society, uh, do we have a way of mapping um, ourselves going forward in terms of how we manage um, ourselves as people. And for, for Brother uh, Maharaj, um, similar to the question my colleague posed, to be honest, I simply cannot see um, you know, the connection between religion and, and, and climate change. Um, and I am really wondering and pretty much confused about how are we going to even, how are faith-based faith organizations going to organize themselves when we know religion 
different religions can hardly agree among themselves on anything, even within denominations. So who will be um, the representatives? You know, if you get a bunch of organizations together, um, will, we, will they be saying the same thing that we're supposed to be thinking about taking care of the taking care of the planet we have here instead of thinking about going into the sky in an afterlife so how are we going to manage that process of bringing religions Great. together thank you very Thanks. much any more questions i think we'll take a couple more and, and once again quickly please because time is upon us We've talked about building codes, and it is really critical that, that the codes reflect what is happening in terms of our increasing vulnerability to these disasters. Excuse me. <clears throat> but one of the my biggest concerns, and a concern of all planners in Trinidad and Tobago, is the extent of unauthorized development. You know, if people are not even having the buildings approved, then they're not being evaluated by the engineering agencies, and I think in, in a, I think it's a little different in, in the other Caribbean countries. I think from what I've heard, <laughs> we are uh, um, the least law abiding in terms of planning in the Caribbean. But, but the thing is, I, I dread what, hap what is going to happen to us in the event of a major um, hurricane, for instance. John talked about Professor Egard. <laughs> talked about the East Coast and the, and the issue of the insurers not insuring buildings along the East Coast now. So it is critical for the, I don't know why, there was a few years ago there was a hotel that was actually destroyed along the East Coast. And I had been meaning to find out whether that hotel was approved. And, and, and if it was, why not, you know, was the planning agency aware of the problem of, 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 of course everybody's aware, but do we take enough consideration of the issue of sea level rise and, um, and coastal erosion that are being made worse by global warming? So it is, it is okay. as an urban Great. planner, like I said, it is um, the issue of planning is Great. critical. Thank you, yes. I think there were a couple other questions. We go all the way to the back. And quickly, your name, affiliation, and question, please. My name is Sylvia Samson Cayetano. I'm a native of Belize via Jamaica, now living in Trinidad. Uh, as an indigenous woman of Belize, I'm Garifuna. My heart bleeds for the Kalinago of the region, the indigenous people of the region who have lost everything. It's been a fight for our lands. We've been displaced and put on carrier reserves and everything damaged, gone. In the light of what, have hap what has happened recently, you sp um, the, the, the Prime Minister of Dominica spoke about villages, one particular village he mentioned, a river appeared in the middle of the village. Some houses were washed away. They're looking for the families. Um, the inability to reach so many other villages far flung on the other side of the island. As a result, there'll be a need to relocate these villages. And I'm listening to you talking about the effects of relocation, forced relocation. And my heart just pains in watching my people becoming climate refugees, as you describe them. Um, the question is, how do you, Sidera, what, what's the, the question is how impactful will your contribution be to CARICOM, to our ministers, everybody feeling this pinch, as to implementing the policy, implementing the movement on the ground as to how th this will be managed, relocation, the impacts of the, the most vo the vulnerable people besides the aged and the babies. Thank you. Great, thank you. A really important question, yes. Um, and we need to really move quickly. Time is upon us, so we can just take one more. We Very quickly, 
uh, Ansel Kirk, Ministry of Planning and Development. I just wanted Mr. Jackson to just clarify for me very quickly. When you said we need to close the nexus between climate change and disaster risk uh, reduction, just expand a little bit on exactly what you, you mean there. That's, that's my question. Okay, great. So um, we, we'll not take any more questions because of time, but we have more time when we have our reception. So. Um, a set of very small questions for you to, to respond to in a very short period of time. But, um, you know, if you focus on the public and people who are really on the fringes of survival, how can we be proactive in developing policies that will make a difference to their lives now? So, this sounds wonderful. We can talk about religion and climate change, but we know that there's a fundamental difference in terms of science and, and the religious community. How can we really bridge that gap? Um, what are some of the opportunities at the level of the general society? Um, are there things that are being lost? Are there new opportunities that are being created as we look at the, the impacts of climate change? So um, religion and climate change, it sounds nice, but we know that um, among religious communities, there isn't enough cohesion all the time. They're not necessarily getting along. How do you build a movement across um, an interfaith dialogue that really is action-oriented around climate change issues, building codes, unauthorized development in Trinidad. Are we putting ourselves more and more at risk? What can we really do about that? Um, indigenous populations and displacement, we know of this from the Pacific. Um, what difference are you really going to make on the ground? Um, how are you going to impact indigenous people's lives in a very concrete way? This gap between climate change and disaster risk reduction tell us more. So um, you can address one or two of those questions. Um, and we'll start with you, brother, but, but quickly, yes, please. Sure. To my sister, there is a beautiful saying, and that is, religion without science is lame. Science without spirituality is blind. Which means, therefore, we both have to work together. I don't think either can exist without each other. In response to my brother, you, you are 100% correct. Even in this country, we are not united, even people of the same feet. Okay, 100% correct. And hence the reason when I started my presentation, I shared my personal experiences of what I had to do single-handedly i give you one ex example. June 30th, 2015, when I went to Enterprise, I was told, if you come back here, we have an AK-47 for you. I took the decision of not being fearful about life. I called the police. They said, we're going to support you. We went in there, and as I said, the evidence is there for three months, not a murder. Yesterday, the police in Shagwanis called me to join with them on Saturday coming for a similar peace walk. Somebody have to come to the forefront. We have to, and I indicate that also in my presentation, put aside politics, put aside race. I use a term earlier today, humanity. That's important. Even if you don't belong to any religion or any of these groups, be concerned as we are concerned for our brothers and sisters in Dominica. I make one final comment. When I heard Ronald spoke about the church that was standing, our meditation center in St. Martin, not a galvanized, was blown off. Our meditation center in Puerto Rico, it's the same. The role in religion in Puerto Rico, fortunately, in our building there, we have a gas stove, whilst many of the others use electricity. What is the role of religion? Well, the neighbors are coming there so we can cook and feed them. At least they can get a meal. So religion do have a part to play, and it goes beyond who belong to you, who follow you, etc., etc. My suggestion, don't try to do that. It wouldn't happen. Sorry to say that, but it's the reality. Okay, thank you. Ron? Uh, quickly. All, all good questions. Uh, before coming here, I, I knew about the sort of religious teachings on stewardship, but for the person who asked about the linkage, um, there are like about 30 or 80 quotes on stewardship. If you read them, you're going to see a tremendous linkage to this dialogue around 
the so-called causes of, of the climate change. Um, perspectives, religious perspectives on rewards for doing the right thing, etc., etc. I encourage you to have a look at it and to open your mind <laughs> in that context. I'm not saying that, but it's, it's certainly something I looked at. On the questions posed to Sedema specifically, as it relates to the impact of Sedema on the ground in the relocation issues. Um, unfortunately, our mandate does not go into reconstruction, into recovery and reconstruction. Um, what we have done is to develop a model recovery framework which speaks to some of these issues. And our efforts really have been driving this towards national level adoption and adaptation to national context. However, as recent as yesterday, in our donor partners um, briefing session, which we host daily, um, I have, I've been a very strong advocate for this issue around how not just the indigenous community, but those who are in modest situations are going to be treated within this reconstruction process. Because there, there are things that are mobilizing, which I'm, I'm fearing is going to put people back into the same, same situation. And we remain advocates in that, in that regard. But for us, and also for the planners, I made the point earlier in my presentation around the convening power of the church, but also the role of the citizens. And I don't think the citizens' voice is being galvanized in changing the dimension between the, the importance of sound planning practice, land use and so forth. Why is it that as Caribbean people we leave and we go to the developed world and we toe the line as it relates to these particular requirements, but we, we, we refuse to have it done in our, our environment which we should love and want to see prosper. I'll leave that there. Um, on the issue of the climate change comment, what I said was not to close the nexus between DRR and, and climate change, but to take advantage of the nexus between disastrous reduction and climate change. Because invariably, most of the, the negative side of climate change, I talked about the opportunities, which is in uh, renewable energy, but on the, the other side of it, most of it leads to humanitarian consequences, whether it is displacement from, from settlements, whether it is environmental health disasters, whether it is disaster risk, whether it is crop, crop losses, which leads to famine, it all comes back to humanitarian consequences. And so we need to really look at that, you know, the opportunity that the nexus um, brings in relation to harmonizing governance, financing, etc. Thank you, Lizzie. Very quick. I know we're short on time. Um, two points. I think one on how do we build bridges. Um, from the Nature Conservancy's perspective, I think the first is recognition that faith communities and faith groups um, are natural partners and we need to sit down and have dialogue about how we can work together. But I think the second piece is that the first question we ask is how can we help? What can we bring to the table first to support um, where we have aligned objectives with conservation and recognizing that their, the objectives of the faith group may be quite different. It may be poverty reduction, um, feeding the hungry, um, but we find where we have aligned priorities and we try to work together to, to deliver on those. The second point is what can we do um, to support uh, indigenous communities and particularly indigenous women? Um, this is something we're just now starting to work on at the Nature Conservancy. Uh, we had a meeting in Palau in March where we brought together indigenous women, um, 19 women from across uh, six island nations um, to share their knowledge and their experiences um, coping with climate change and how they're actually leading um, adaptation on the ground. And then our commitment was um, they were identifying policies that were needed to address women's needs. And we are helping to um, share those at the COP. We're having a sidebar bringing some of those women to share their perspectives and their views um, and their priorities so that they'll be heard by world leaders and hopefully can inform, um, in, inform national policies. Obviously, more work needs to be done there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Agarin. I'm, um, I'm going to say that um, there is not a total inconsistency and fallout between science and religion. Uh, what we need to concentrate on is where there is concordance. Um, I would say a healthy planet, healthy people. Um, and that is a 
principle that is deeply embedded in both religions. Uh, you would find in particularly Eastern religions, you know, um, Mother Earth is what is described that, uh, that people are dependent and are part of the environment. Um, if we stare at that level rather than fight and fuss about the fine details and the science, because that principle, I, I think, um, is, is quite critical in going forward. Um, a healthy planet and a healthy people, and the, the, the role that religions have to play in organizing people to, in fact, act in accordance with that, that, that big principle that everybody, uh, you know, I think can adhere to. Um, in fact, the reality of the situation is that the biggest fallout is probably in the Christian world, where some people have interpreted Genesis to mean that, you know, human beings have a right to dominate the planet. Okay, rather than interpret it within the framework of stewardship. That, okay, um, but, but again, among various Christian religions, there's a big push to embed the principle of stewardship, that you cannot create life, you have a responsibility. Yes, you can use it, but to, to, to not destroy the ability of the planet to continue in a sustainable way to maintain life is a, a, you know, a very compelling principle that I think most people could, could adhere to. Um, when I look at my science and I show you all these models and all of these graphs and stuff, the Earth looks like a living thing. Okay, you you see, you know, you see warm periods and ice ages, and you see carbon dioxide changing. And you know, we breathe in and out carbon dioxide. It's, this looks like a living thing in which the parts fit together in a very intricate way and are dependent on each other. Okay, we cannot exist without plants, you know, take in carbon dioxide, they produce oxygen, which we require. We can't, unless you eat dirt and, and, and rock, you have to eat living material, which is, you know, life. This, this we're intimately entwined. Uh, it, you know, uh, you, 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 it does not make any sense for, uh, for us to destroy the basis of our own survival. We, we are part of it. And I think those principles certainly sound religious. That's what religions have been saying forever before all of the science. Wow. So I, I think we've really uh, covered a lot uh, this evening. I think we started really with a discussion about where we're at. We said we wanted to learn what was happening and we, we heard a lot about this proof of concept. So climate change is happening, it's having an impact on us. That led to us to have a discussion about morality and how morality fits in and what's our responsibility to act on that. But it was also a very interesting component. It was not solely a question or an argument about morality that was also presented in terms of the economic opportunity. So it, addressing climate change can be profitable. It, it is a way for us to think about how we make money, but still that was not moving policy and why. What we discussed was that ultimately we needed to focus on impacts on people. And that was health, water availability, agriculture, food security, looking at coastal areas. And when we begin to message about the impact on people, we begin to open up the space for uh, appropriate policies and actions. And that ultimately allows us to bring in our religious beliefs on an individual level and to think about how we engage religious communities from an organizational level. So regardless of whether you believe or not that God is the Trinity, that there are opportunity spaces that you could create in thinking about that. So recognizing that context and thinking of us in the Caribbean, we began to think about what we can learn from living on small islands. And we were quite excited to learn examples of innovation and inspiration coming out of the South Pacific. We talked about ways that the South Pacific is serving as a bellwether for the rest of the world, that there were opportunities to look at how islands can serve as natural learning laboratories for innovation and that there were opportunities to think about how we position these issues in an island context to push the political and immoral imperative for action. That led us to think a little bit about how we position 
position our religious beliefs and the religious community in this space. So we heard about the value and importance of bringing religion into this space and what that meant in terms of connecting to the environment. And we said that there are ways that we do that as people of faith. We said we do that vis-a-vis -vis ourselves, how we think of ourselves and our position in the world. We talked about that internally. We talked about the way that we interact with nature externally, and we talked about the ways that we interact with each other, the interpersonal dimension. And ultimately, what we heard from one of our speakers was that this was a question of how we can be builders and keepers of trust. So all of this sounds wonderful, interesting. We've learned a lot more. What does it mean in terms of action and opportunities? So when we look at this, particularly with the saliency of disasters that have recently occurred and the inherent vulnerability, we talked about the need to think of ways to bridge the gap between development work and the humanitarian work, that we need to think about ways to bring those two communities together. How do we move that political will to recognize climate change is important in an island context to political action through resource allocation for disasters and better policy harmonization? And how do we leverage the potential of the religious, organized religious community to leverage its assets and social capital through convening power and organizing? And ultimately, this led to our conclusion around a framework of our well-being and ultimately how we position ourselves within the context. We said that ultimately we are a part of it and perhaps we need to be thinking about healthy people, healthy planet as a framing for communication, engagement, political activism, financing and partnerships. Wow, you guys covered a lot. That was amazing, an amazing discussion. I think an amazing culmination of uh, two days of, of engagement. And now it's time for food and drink and to continue our discussion. So join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you to our host here at the Institute, and I'm really looking forward to our going back and looking at the recording of this discussion today. I think we will work towards providing a short summary of the panel, and we will advertise that for you. So this discussion today lives on. This is the basis of further engagement, and as a graduate of the Institute, I want you to keep coming back here and engage with our um, partners here at the Institute. So thank you very much. Please stay for the reception and continue the conversation. And I will hand it over to our director, Jessica, for a final word as we move on. From adding my own very, very warm thanks to the panel, I think this was a fantastic afternoon. And to let you know that Zara. towards the food. So thank you very much, everybody. I think it's been a wonderful afternoon.